The small city of Rasaini, one of the oldest communities in Lithuania, was among the first places to be attacked when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union in 1941. And the scars still run deep. Local historian Lina Kontotina points to this arrangement of rocks forming a Star of David. This is all that remains of Rasaini's once thriving Jewish community, marking the spot where Jewish civilians were executed. Lithuania's Jewish population of 250,000 was almost completely wiped out in the Holocaust, more so than in any other country. Only around 5% of Lithuanian Jews survived, including Ellie Gotts. This is when I was 13. The Lithuanian Canadian was just 13 when the Nazis invaded. And the Nazis announced, we are liquidating the ghetto. Liquidation to us meant one thing, they are going to liquidate us too. Gotts and his parents escaped execution by hiding in their cellar. Later, he was sent to the notorious Dachau concentration camp. And Dachau was hell. Dachau was terrible. People died of hunger. I weighed 70 pounds when I was liberated. His family eventually moved to Canada. Decades later, in 1982, Gotts learned one of the Nazis accused of murdering thousands of Jews in his hometown was now living on his same street in Toronto. Hey, Rauka, Rauka was here. Had no idea. He lived next to us. This is Helmut Rauka. Helmut Rauka lived in Canada for decades before he was eventually extradited to Germany, where he died awaiting trial. It took 32 years to find him. I could have found him for five, five minutes. He was in a phone book in Toronto. Even at 95, Gotts continues to share his story with thousands of students and others every year. And part of that history lesson includes Canada's shameful, anti-Semitic secret. Helmut Rauka wasn't alone. After the war, many suspected Nazis escaped to Canada. They hid for decades in plain sight, their names and alleged war crimes all but forgotten. Until now. It's necessary to teach society that you don't get away with it. This isn't a Lithuanian story. To me, this is a Canadian story. To bring those remaining few surviving perpetrators and collaborators to justice. Accused war criminals, people that the government claimed were not in Canada, I was able to locate. Many of Abby Korb's family members were killed in the Holocaust. The expert in hate and extremism has worked with police and intelligence agencies around the world. And in her spare time, she's a Nazi hunter. These people committed crimes. They should be held accountable. Most of them refugees who have already fled from persecution. The Second World War sparked the largest refugee crisis the world has ever seen. Canada welcomed more than 150,000 refugees. But only around 5,000 Jews were allowed into Canada during the Nazis' rule, the fewest of any allied nation. History tells us it was far easier um, for a Nazi to immigrate uh, to Canada. Mark Fryman's parents survived the Holocaust and came to Canada in 1952. He says anti-Semitism was still widespread then and the government was suddenly more concerned with catching communists than Nazis. The Canadian government um, uh, wasn't picky uh, in terms of looking at possible Nazi past in immigrants from Eastern Europe. Holocaust survivors were arriving on ships with the people who committed heinous crimes against them on the same ships. People were submitting names to the police, to the government, you know, upon arrival. Lists containing thousands of names of alleged Nazis were sent to Canadian authorities and passed down to members of the Jewish community, including Saul Littman. I think this is a matter of history for over 40 years. The prominent journalist and scholar spent decades calling for investigations into Nazi war criminals. In the 1980s, Korb worked for Littman as a researcher. Following his death in 2017, she became the custodian of hundreds of Nazi war crimes files. 
some great men and women did an incredible amount of work 50, 60 years ago, but the police failed to investigate these claims properly. So Korb conducted her own investigations, combing through archives in Israel, Moscow, and the Vatican. I was able to piece together files that were poorly investigated using old phone books. I've dived through dumpsters, recycle bins. I've really gotten my hands dirty on this. And that dirty work paid off. I found a lot of them. Korb says the majority of suspected Nazis in Canada have passed away, but dozens are still alive, many now well into their 90s. And one case in particular captured Korb's attention. There was a Holocaust testimony from a survivor who stated that a woman smashed Jewish babies on, with rocks. That horrific testimony came from the Lithuanian city of Rasaini. We asked historian Lina Kontantina about the case. She says a witness claimed to have seen two Lithuanian women beating young Jewish children to death with rocks. Many Lithuanians helped the Nazis to kill Jews, she says. Korb's investigation into that alleged baby killer led her to the other side of the world and into a hallowed place. The Yad Vashem archives, perched on Israel's Mount of Remembrance, opened in 1957. It's home to the largest collection of Holocaust archival material in the world. Rows of shelves holding original handwritten accounts chronicling the horrors of the Holocaust. And the testimony in this file is damning. It's very, very important information for us. This Yad Vashem researcher showed us testimony written in 1945, almost immediately after Lithuania's liberation, by a survivor named Dina Zeiss Flum. Here we can see exactly the words where Dina speaks, writes about uh, the perpetrator. Dina Flum described how the Jews of Rasaini were systematically executed. When the women and children were brought to the pits, Flum slipped away. She wrote how she hid in a barn under the hay and watched. Laying in the barn, I could well see two women standing at the pit, small children's heads being hit with heavy stones, or one head at the other child's head. One of the women was the student Klimaita. Klimaita. The student Klimaita. No first name was provided, but those clues gave investigators a place to start. This same story came up in three or four different Holocaust testimonies, two of which gave the same name. And there was evidence that two sisters with the same last name came to Canada. That last name, Klimaita, isn't uncommon in Lithuania. Immigration records revealed two possible matches. Lithuanian sisters who arrived in Canada in 1948 aboard this ship, carrying refugees and soldiers. The eldest sister, Joanna, was born in 1923, making her 18 at the time Flum claimed to have seen the student Klimaita killing Jewish babies. Upon arrival in Canada, Joanne Klimaita listed her occupation as student, and her place of birth was about 70 kilometers from Rasaini. On one hand, for security purposes. In 1985, under pressure from Jewish groups, the federal government formed the Deschen Commission, an independent inquiry to investigate claims that Canada had become a haven for Nazis. An RCMP war crimes unit was also created. It launched hundreds of investigations into suspected Nazis in Canada, including Klimaita. Korb obtained some of the documents from the Klimaita investigation through access to information. The goal of the police probe into the murder of Jewish babies was to determine if Klimaita was guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity, and to ensure her entry into Canada was not through fraudulent means. But their investigation proved problematic. They didn't pursue things properly. They didn't do, conduct proper investigations. In 
1993, a Canadian government researcher was sent to Lithuania to investigate the suspected Nazi cases. But according to police documents, they never traveled here to Rosini due to time constraints and higher priority files. It appears investigators never found the key witness, Dina Flum, who claimed to have seen the student Klimaita, who smashed the heads of Jewish children with rocks. A year later, in 1994, police wrote, nothing has been done on this file. The allegation provides a last name only, and no other information to confirm the Canadian is the subject of the allegation. Without further historical research, we will not be able to tie the suspect to these atrocities. She was accused of infanticide. Those are heavy-duty claims for a file that went nowhere. In 1995, one of the investigation's last available entries, a Department of Justice official wrote, the RCMP should be asked to try or continue attempts to locate Klimaita in Canada or find out whether she is dead. It's unclear if police ever located or spoke with Klimaita. Global News recently tracked down a Lithuanian woman named Joanna, maiden name Klimaita, who lived in Ontario. But by then, it was too late. Okay, I'm Jeff, I'm with uh, Global News. Her family told us she died a couple of years ago. She was 99. Her children said they know nothing about the allegations in Rosini. Much of the file remains redacted, the government citing privacy concerns. I don't understand how you can balance uh, the rights of a deceased person against the rights of um, people to know the truth. Mark Fryman, a former Deputy Attorney General for Ontario, has been working with CORB for years, lobbying the government to release Canada's Nazi war crimes files. The names and many details from the police investigations and the final Duchenne Commission's report remain redacted, secret, locked away inside Library and Archives Canada. I think a lot of the files contain embarrassing revelations about the Canadian government, the Canadian police, the Canadian Prosecution Service. Of the more than 1,500 RCMP investigations, none of the suspected Nazis have ever been successfully prosecuted. Records show many of the investigations were stopped before they even started because the suspects were deemed too elderly. One investigation into the highest ranking Nazi in Canada was recommended for closure due to the advanced age of the 87-year-old subject. That is what Canada has become. 95-year-old Holocaust survivor Ellie Gotts says it's never too late to do the right thing. The need, reason it's necessary to do justice is not because of them. They are too old. It's necessary to teach society that you don't get away with it. Helmut Rauka who is said to have murdered thousands of Jews in Gotz's hometown, is the only Nazi to ever be extradited from Canada. On the issue of, of, of identifying and prosecuting Nazi, suspected Nazi war criminals, how would you describe the Canadian government's work and their record on Very poor. Uh, the track record of Canada on condemning the war issues, the war criminals, is very poor, very poor. Last fall, that poor track record provoked international outrage. A Canadian-Ukrainian said to have fought for the Nazis received a standing ovation in Parliament. Yaroslav Hunka, honored in the House of Commons during a visit by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. On behalf of all of us in this house, I would like to present unreserved apologies Following the incident, the Prime Minister said he had instructed senior bureaucrats to determine whether Ottawa should release more of its Nazi war crimes files. This month, the government declassified 15 pages of the Radal Report, produced with the Duchenne Commission in 1985. But no names and few new details were revealed. And there was the moment of embarrassment. Promises were made to look into the entire war crimes issue and that's the last I heard of it. 
Do you think that moment of embarrassment will spur any more action from the government? I'm not holding my breath. Then, two weeks after Parliament's embarrassing history lesson, came the deadliest attack on Jewish civilians since the Holocaust. October 7th, the day Hamas attacked, Korb happened to be in Israel with her daughter. It was probably the scariest time of my life. 1,200 Israelis were killed and hundreds more taken hostage, including Alex Danzig, the 75-year-old historian worked at the Yad Vashem archives. The attack, an affront to Yad Vashem's mantra, never again. Korb spent the coming days and weeks ducking in and out of bomb shelters and volunteering at this donation center in Jerusalem, providing aid and supplies to families forced from their homes. Jews come together. We're a strong group of people and we have to let the world know. But suddenly, Jews around the world found themselves under attack. My synagogue in Montreal, where I grew up, my father was a founding member, was firebombed. Bullets were through the door. The school where my family members, my daughter went to school here, had bomb threats. It's scary. You can't walk around without feeling unsafe. Korb says the new wave of attacks on Jewish communities only underscores the importance of Holocaust education and accountability. Look what's going on in the world. We keep saying never again, but it's happening every single day. We have to uncover the truth. We have to. Canada is a, is a land of immigrants, and all of them came from all over, and we lived quite well here until relatively recently. Now there is a new hatred, and that hatred is terrible. I never thought I would see that in Toronto. God says the moral of his own story, which he shares with anyone who will listen, is the importance of letting go of hate. And after the war, I was full of hate. When I came out of hospital, I was looking for a gun. I was going to kill Germans. But one day I said to myself, what are you thinking? Stop hating. You, you are poisoned. And I gave up hate. I started to study. So when I stopped hating, I started living for the first time. 